Hi, and welcome everybody to another special Women in Safety. Amadeep, who do we have with us today? Hey everyone, good morning. My name is Amadeep Beasla with Salus. Um, so today we have Janice Stanley. Her 11 years of experience in health and safety and di diverse background in other industries like film and healthcare make Janice Stanley a force to be reckoned with in the world of safety. As a self-taught individual, her passion for the safety and well-being of those around her has led her to create a successful career as a woman in safety. Her confidence and strong will are just some of the things that make Janice a valuable leader in a male-dominated space of safety. And just on a personal note, um, Janice and I, we've been friends for God knows how long, so it's not even work. And uh, we've been to plenty and many uh, breakfasts and brunches and just catching up and just really just, oh my God, I have so much love for you. So thank you so much for coming out. I totally, totally appreciate, appreciate it. And this is going to be awesome. Awesome. Hi there. How's everybody today? Great. Thank you, Janice, so much for joining us. I'm really excited about um, the episode that we're having today. And I wanted to kick it off by learning more about what was your first experience when you were coming into the workforce and then going into safety? Because I understand you started in the workforce in the late 90s, and then you joined us in safety a little bit after. So can you share that journey with us? Sure, absolutely. Uh 18 years old, I wanted a real job. So my sister was a journeyman for John Deere and a um, client of theirs was asking for women to come uh, learn to drive heavy equipment. And I wasn't working at the time and, and my sister nominated my name and the guy called me and it was so different and it's so exciting. I, I jumped on it and um, Back then, and that would be like late 76, 77, um, there was no safety on the job. You were lucky to even have to wear a hard hat or a vest. Um, you did have to have steel toed boots, I remember that. Um, but at the time, can you imagine being a, a dozer operator and guiding guys who were scraping earth who've been doing it forever and all of a sudden you're the new dog on the block and you're supposed to be telling and guiding them where to go. Well, I'll tell you, I never played more smash them up and bang with equipment than anything because these guys didn't want me to lead them. They wanted to put their digger down where they were going to put it and I had to come catch up to them and push them, right? So definitely no, no uh, women were appreciated on the job, but we, we pushed through. After that, uh, I, I kind of went into, uh, I did that for a few years and then I went into sales because I thought maybe mobile equipment wasn't really for me. It was really quite a brutal introduction to construction. And I went into sales for several years and I, and I became uh, more of a safety professional through mentors like Tony Robbins and really explored that opportunity to sales and market. And I went into things that I loved and I loved nutrition and I loved health at the time. I was quite a fitness buff at the time. So I, um, and then in the meantime, I was getting married. So I ended up moving to the States and got married to a fellow and ran this, you know, our, our nutrition clinics and, and um, fitness camps. After 15 years, uh, I, I really did miss family. I came back to Canada and I, uh, that would be about 2005. And at that time, I decided to go into, I'm not going to give away my age, but it was, um, I was in my 40s. And I decided to go on to a whole new career. And that was into healthcare. It sort of segued from the nutrition part, because it's all about health. But at the time, I wanted a job that was going to be uh, a needed profession. So I was taking upgrading to get my nursing, and I got my healthcare aid status at the same time, and ended up working in dementia healthcare. Wow. which I really loved. I worked at maybe four or five different hospitals. So I got to see different perspectives, different hospitals. I worked on Salt Springs, so a very remote um, kind of a, an area. Uh, but again, it, shaping who you are. And, you know, it's good to, it's, uh, for me, it's good to change careers because it really changed who I was all along. But underlying, it was mostly because I was chasing the money. I wanted Absolutely. to make more money. 
Absolutely. And I remember back then that healthcare was a really up and coming. So mm -hmm. up and coming. Yeah. And it, and it still is. We need them. But it's also a, a platform where you can experience heavy burnout or yeah. nervous breakdowns. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I did. I did experience it. Um, even though my heart is still with, you know, dementia patients and I would turn around tomorrow and help somebody, you just can't do that in a day to day job. No. So uh, one of my coworkers, I, I said to her, I, I really need to think of another career. And it was unfortunate because I'd only been doing it for five years and felt like, wow, I'm going to walk away from something I just spent a ton of money getting trained in. But I, I had to. And she said, well, look at the occupational first aid trainer uh, course. And I went, oh, OK. <laughs> so that was sort of my first introduction to oh, wow, safety and, and medics. Uh, I really hadn't ever heard of it before. So I did take my OFA three. And I failed, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is kind of funny, but it's not because at that time, I was also not only had I lost a career, but I was also in a five year relationship that was breaking up. So oh, my wow. brain was not into training and studying, but I, I put for, you know, strong leader, I'll push through, you know? Yeah. And Mental health is so important. What oh, is Oh Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Dude, Janet, when you were going through that, like when you were, I'm just trying to wrap my head around it when you were going through your schooling and like as you were transitioning into it did you see very many um women or did you see other women kind of chasing or not chasing but pursuing this at the same time or do you feel like it was you could already kind of see the the writing on the wall and it was predominantly male like right from the the hop yeah both classes i took there was two or three women in each class Okay. And it was, a, what, 18 people in the class, 15 people in the class. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and when you're in your training, you speak to other people that are heading maybe into safety or have been, or they're recertifying and you hear their stories. Yeah. Um, and yeah, oil and gas was the place to be. You know, that's what everybody was pushing for. You know that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You and I, yeah, we, we've spoke about this before, but share many of experiences. Um, yeah. Especially when it comes to being in the oil patch and being the only female on the crew. <laughs> yeah. So Tamara, after that, when I failed the OFA three twice, I thought, boy, oh boy, what am I going to do? <laughs> but I had to get out of BC. I wanted to go back to Alberta. And that's when I fell back on my heavy equipment operating. Ah. And they took me back after what, 30 years out of the field? That's oh, how desperate how, they were for mobile equipment how operators. How was that? Like, how was it for you personally? Like, I, I, I've struggled with ageism before too, but yeah. Yeah, I worked for uh, Mackay Group, you know, the, the company. Yeah. Yep. And they requested a girl at every uh, mine. Yeah. And they didn't have any women at the Jack Pine mine. So okay. I went to the Jack Pine mine and started... Um, uh, training on the heavy haulers, the 400 ton. Nice, nice. On shell, yeah. right? Jack yeah. Pine and MRF. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember those days. So yeah. I was wondering, Janice, when you were doing the mining work, because that's a very high risk environment, did your health and safety come in there? That was when I realized say, there was a different mode of safety. The first time I went to the orientation with Shell, this big booming dude comes in with a voice that you could, you know, the world could hear. He didn't need a microphone. He scared me to death at, at, at what he said. Mm. And my inner self knew that's what I want to do. Because the safety when guy was, who was booming yeah, at you? <laughs> yeah, he booed at, at no 300 <laughs> people in the room, in the orientation room. <laughs> I wanted to do that job. And and I thought, wow, I when I was doing the 200 hours in the, in the seat and as a passenger, learning how to drive heavy haulers, the instructor was the worst. He, I nearly died three times because of his, he fell asleep. He drove too close to a cliff. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I can go on, but it was then that I went, okay, I don't think I wanna do this. I wanted that guy's position. And that's- and what, what was I his can, name? I can't reveal that. Oh, okay. <laughs> His first name's good. Just it sounds like he was a, a mentor. Uh, which guy? The, in the safety, safety at Shell? 
No, no, the safety manager that you, when you first met the safety, that's who I wanted to, Mike, yeah, put a name on Mike, because he's our hero, right? So yeah. great for Mike for turning you on to safety. Now, now, how did Mike help? Did he help you get into safety? Was he your mentor? How, what did that relationship look like? Okay, let's go back. Remember, in construction since 18, never had a formal orientation in my life. Right. Wow. Wow. So now I'm in an orientation. How are you doing, Malcolm? I never had an orientation before. And um, for me, that was really important to uh, like, holy wow, somebody actually cares about me. Yeah. Somebody actually cares about my safety in this journey. Right. And so I guess that influence was because coming from a healthcare background and keeping people safe, yeah. it, it was just a segue for me. It was just a different mode. Right. Do you think women almost have an easier time with health and safety and being in the field opposed to men? Because like we do have that empathy, that emotion, we have that, that inner intuition almost, if you want to call it that. Uh, You know what? Men are from Mars. Women are from Venus. I believe that (laughs) men bring a certain perspective that we really need. Yeah. And women bring a perspective. I really believe women and men together in that workplace is a really awesome balance. Yeah. Because yeah. men, I think do Malcolm maybe have something to say about that and Amber, but I just feel that um, if we don't have the two, like for instance, Mike, if Mike had this spoke up and used his booming voice versus let's say a Tina who had a tiny voice, I probably would have been disinterested. Yeah. Right? So yeah. his influence his um, confidence and being a natural leader and a confident person, I, I was drawn to him. You are very confident. You are so strong. You're one of the strongest women I know, actually. Um, that's awesome. <laughs> now, when you were uh, with Fort Mackay at the, uh, cause I too, I work for the Fort Mackay group of companies. So shout out to Fort Mackay. <laughs> um, that was, I think it was like my first, one of my first jobs of safety. When you were up there, did you feel like the, the whole organization as a collective or as a whole that they were supporting women in trades? Because they've actually recently had, um, I saw a post on LinkedIn where they were promoting women and specifically because of the uh, Indigenous background, they were having Indigenous women being trained up. But do, do you remember when you were with the organization and because going back to a point that you just had said where you were talking about how they wanted more women in the seats. Do, do you remember or do you recall? <clears throat> yeah. So I told you they had to have one woman per mine. Yeah. In, in, yeah. in, in the equipment. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to be, can I be really frank about this? Because yeah. this is what happened. I get up there, I get my, um, I finish all the uh, training and they put me in my own vehicle. Now I'm on my own driving. The, the first, uh, the foreman they assigned me to was the cousin to the um, uh, owner of Fort Mackay Group. Okay. When he first saw me, his eyes bugged out. He was a little annoyed. And he actually ignored me right from the get-go, wouldn't address me, wouldn't address, he would talk to everybody else in the toolbox, he wouldn't address me. Every other team had an Indigenous, beautiful young girl. This guy gets the old white girl. (laughs) And he made it really clear because they talked about it. And he said, yeah, I get the old bag. Okay. Yeah. And he knew he couldn't just say, hey, you're, you know, be um, um, disrespectful and, and, and uh, um, tell me I had to leave. They found a way to fire me. Mm-hmm. And that's another story. But yeah, they found a way to fire me and I couldn't fight it because the owner was the uncle. And but I, it's still and I, part of the story. Because that influenced who people are helping, whose people are mentoring, who people are succession planning in mm-hmm. health and safety, right? If people mm-hmm. are discriminatory that way. Yeah, yeah. they discriminate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, I shared this on another episode where my health and safety manager, when I was going to him for some career direction, thought it was an opportunity to ask me on a date. And when I declined, that was the end of my career. 
right? And I overheard comments being made about me, about how, you know, well, we're not going to bother with her. And that's not why people come to work. So Janice, that, that is a challenge. How did you rise up and become the woman that you are today? Because those type of things do help shape and define us as, per, as our professional self. So share with us that part of the story. What you just said, I've been in that situation too, um, you know, especially on a night shift. Women have to just hold their place. I mean, I... If I, I knew which battle to battle and which battle not to battle, you, ha you have to really understand who you're dealing with. Um, I was put in a situation because I worked hard to get my name out there and I took the time to train. What I didn't like was how little they made me feel, right? And at some point, a leader and an, and an independent person like myself goes, you know what? Fuck this. I am not going to be put in this situation where people think they can undermine me and make me feel less than I am. So I then, uh, I just, I just stepped back. I knew I was stepping back from a lot of money and possibly ruining my name. But at that point, that wasn't like Man Deep said, mental health is more important than the money. Yeah. But absolutely. it wasn't going to end. Right. I don't know if you heard stories up there, but I, I, it's not going to end. Men are going to take advantage if they can get away with it. Yeah. Um, and I'm not pointing fingers at men. It just, that's all the stories. I've never heard of a woman doing it to a man. Right. You know what? Just, it was hard. Like, uh, cause I see them, the work camps up there and I was so, I was still very, I want to say young, naive, impressionable. Um, I got into corrections at a very young age too. And being up in Fort McMurray in those work camps where there's nothing but men. And it's almost like, like some, like there were allies and mentors and they're not, I can't paint them all with the same brush. And there were like a handful, I would say of the, the bad apples, but for the most part, everyone was good. But yeah, like you're in camp and you see these people at work. Now you're seeing them in, in camp later that night throughout the day, you're always with these guys and for them to try and take advantage of you or try and ask you on a date or um, make some advances and moves and you just boundaries and you just got to shut it down. Thanks for the compliment, but it's inappropriate or let's be professional here. Right. And yeah, there were times, I mean, like, and I can't even blame the guys. Cause like th there were, there were instances where there were women that were approaching me and, and trying to ask me out on a date. And then, and I was just like, no, that's, that's enough. Like, please no, Right. So just when you think you're getting the women's wing, it's not always the case. <laughs> so I guess that that opens up the floor to a question that I have is about allies. What can allies be doing to provide support? Can you give us some ideas, Janice, in your experience? Oh, yeah. what, when you needed that support, what would you have loved to have gotten from others? Okay, so I, I was in camp, so and... What all what Amandie just said is true. My allies had to be someone that I felt uh, would stand beside me. And I remember when I was in Fort Mac a year or two earlier as a sandwich maker, and there was a team of uh, mobile equipment operators that used to come in. And there was this big bad dude, and he had a loud booming voice. He was indigenous, and he had some teeth missing. Like he just looked bad. But for some reason, him and I connected on, on when I would make his sandwiches, right? And then when I got into that mine, I ran into him in the camp. So I went to him and I told him what, and we had sort of developed a friendship. And I went to him and I, and I told him what happened. And I said, I need you beside me. Whenever we're together in this camp, I need you beside me. And I need to know I can count on you. That guy was probably the best at and we still call each other now and this is six seven years later it just he stood beside me he he whenever I had to go into a situation he said I'll go with you he he and if he if I had to go be on another team he'd say I'm coming with you like he he got to know who the team was the thing the best thing you can do is find the biggest baddest dude and have him become your friend <laughs> ha I love that I yeah. love because everybody's afraid of him too yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's true. True story. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so that's partly what shaped me and my safety too. 
<laughs> oh, yeah. You got to find your friends and pick your battles. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. absolutely. Allies are important because they help rise us up, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Let's talk about present day. So what have you experienced recently uh, where you thought your gender was a factor, like both positive and negative? Um, um, okay, I got to be careful here. Uh, I work with a culture that doesn't um, typically have white women leading them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that has been a bit of a challenge if that's the negative. But in because you and I, we've talked about it extensively. Yeah. But yeah, the positive yeah. is that yeah. because I went in and did my job and maintained a professional, they now respect me. So that is like a huge accomplishment in my life uh, in these last six years is to get a non-English speaking culture that hasn't doesn't know the word hazard and don't follow safety uh, yeah. to, to go from their only safety advisor to now three people in our company who do safety. Um, and turn them around. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Those it's so are, true. Like, I mean, I can present day. language and the culture as well. Like there is no word that defines safety. You can talk about the definition or talk the way around it, or, you know, you can talk about how there's hazards or harms on how your life could be put in jeopardy, but there's no actual verbiage around the word safety. And, and it's hard to explain. And um, I mean, even with myself growing up, I never learned English until I was six years old. And so up until then, and my, my dad's a trucker. So up until then he would explain and he would uh, tell me like how to be safe and make sure you always wear your seatbelt and, you know, just like these key little points and messages and whatnot. But I never learned that, like, our, the, the language just wasn't as complex, right? And now, I mean, Janice deals with that at work, right? So a lot of times you're trying to explain and it's hard, like the struggle. Yeah. Yeah. And then with these men and the, the background and the culture come certain biases and prejudice towards women as well. And like, I was lucky enough where I had supportive brothers. I had a supportive dad. He always kept me uh, equal to my brothers. So the, the experience wasn't as what Janice witnesses is, but um, props to you, Janice. Yeah. Yeah. Dealing with all the different personalities, everything that they bring in, especially with the, the cultural background as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It's fine. Yeah. It doesn't matter what uh, culture or what industry. Um, please don't hate me when I say this. I don't even know that a piece of paper, like a degree matters. I really feel like the field knowledge is what builds the character of the safety person. Yeah. You know, I see a lot of faces here. I'm not sure what Malcolm or Natalie or any Aaron, any of these have done in their life, but um, safety, if you know your job, it doesn't matter where you stand, what company, who you're with, remain a professional and uh, just do your job, right? We don't have to be policemen or patrol cops. We just have to do our job. So if we were to look out, say five, 10, 15 years from today, Janice, what do you envision the future of safety would be for, for women in safety? Can you share that? Mm -hmm. Uh, hold strong to yourself and your beliefs. My beliefs are shaped after professionals, people that made a difference in, in the world. And if they weren't doing anything wrong, I felt if I emulated them, then I would be doing more right things than wrong things. It's very easy to go to the wrong side, but I didn't want to go to the wrong side. So I think women just need to hold their ground. Uh, if they feel like they want to train and, and learn uh, through schooling, I never uh, disregard that. I think schooling is great. I've gone back many times. And I think get your feet wet, get out there and get your feet wet. You've got to get out there and get your feet wet. It, it, like look, Amandeep and I went right into it deep uh, in probably one of the harshest environments. And we're still talking today, you know, so yeah. you just got to go out there, hold your ground, uh, be open be uh don't be negative don't be um 
pessimistic. I think you've got to be open and resilient and transparent and show your voice. Yeah. I remember when you and I, we first met and you were, yeah, you had like quite the uphill battle. And I remember it was that around the whole men don't respect women in certain cultures. So in a workplace that is professional, how do you command that respect or how do you get that respect or how do you have them understand? Right. And like a lot of these people, they come from smaller towns, smaller villages where all they know is what they've been taught. And it wasn't in a school setting and it wasn't anything formal. And so how do we, how do we progress and how do we, how do we work? I mean, Janice, you're everywhere in, in the lower mainland in Vancouver, greater Vancouver, and you're on God knows how many given sites in a, in the draw of a day or in, in the run of a day. And I mean, dealing with like all these personalities and it's male dominated and all these different cultures. And it, it's just, I, I can't even imagine because I, I did not have that experience. Janice, well, have you found through the years some suggestions for our listeners about how to gain that respect? Uh, um, it, that was a really tough hill to climb. I, I, uh, I had to, uh, I'm not going to say get down to their level because that's not fair. They, um, I just had to show them that I cared about them and that they meant everything to me. And that the reason I was there was because I was there to make sure they went home to their family. So you have to earn respect through not being a a bolstering loud voice like I could be. You have to, I I hate to even say this, but maybe you can come up with another word. You get to their level. Hey, I work for the same company as you do. You're hired to do this job. I'm hired to do that job. But respect is about listening understanding and knowing who you're dealing with because if someone comes at me aggressive I can meet that that personality in a heartbeat but if someone gives me respect I can give respect back so I think you just have to hold your ground but still show professionalism and um, don't waver yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, overall, like um, not just where you are today, but looking at like all your workplaces and just kind of high level summing it up here. But did you feel like you had support from your upper management? Did you feel like you had buy-in? Were there times where you questioned what they had said? Was it because of because of the fact of you being a woman? Did that have like an influence on any of that? I think I had a mix of both. I've had, uh, it's kind of funny. One boss is white and one boss is Punjabi. Yeah. Right. So do they get along sometimes? Not really. Right. Cause we think differently. So I get a lot of support a lot of times from my white boss. And sometimes my Punjab boss goes to the side of the culture. Yeah. Right? yeah so you got to yeah. find a way to bring them both up. Will will both bosses ever deny me doing my job? No. Will they ever say I haven't ever done my job? They will praise me to the end, right? Because I do my job. Yeah. But yeah, there's times where, um, you know, one will call the supervisor and say, don't listen to her, do it this way. What do I do? It's his company. Yeah. Yeah. It's your company, dude. You want to say that? Then you do it. And that's what I've experienced. But you know what? I just go out and do my job. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it, it's, this reminds me, um, I get calls sometimes. One of the biggest things is now we're taking culture and it's culture versus safety, which we could probably have a whole entire another podcast about, but I'm going to make this very brief here, but, um, I get calls a lot of times and traditionally in, um, the Sikh faith, which is, I come from the Sikhism faith. I, I practice it very, very loosely. But um, they have turbans and it's an uh, article of faith. And so a lot of times I get asked, and you've come across this before too, where it's like hard hat. How does a hard hat get on? And I know you've had to understand that. And we've had the conversation and working around that as well. 
Um, yeah, do you want to touch up on that? Or Absolutely. Yeah. Listen, yeah. PPE, even though it's the last line of defense, it yeah. is required on a job site. Yeah. And under the fit, use, care, wear, you have to have your head fit in the helmet. I mean, yeah. why do we design a bowl in there for it to just sit on top like a teapot, right? Yeah. It's not how it works. So when they have more than two rats, which most of them have quite either as a wide band or whatever. Yeah. Um, there was a Sikh leader that did go to the federal government. They did have a conversation about it and they talked about it in construction. Yeah. And the Sikh, they didn't disregard the turban, which was a good thing for the faith. The, but they did say it has to be small enough so that the hard hat fits your head. So yeah. that means two wraps of a cloth and there are certainly smart, smaller cloths like the patka that they can wear and yeah. then put the hard hat on and yeah. it fits properly. But what these guys tend to do is they take the device apart. They don't realize they're breaking the law by breaking a safety device. A hard hat is a safety device. They break it, turn it around so they can put that dial here and apparently it fits better over the turban. Not allowed, not allowed. The head has to fit in the turban or in the hard hat, pardon me, if you're wearing a turban. And if they refuse to do that, then they 100% have to have a chin strap on at all times. I'm right. just, I'm going to break in here because we do have a question from LinkedIn. So I wanted to make sure, Anna, that I get your question in there. And she is asking, uh, Janice, if maybe we could talk about your experience in getting buy-in in a less than positive safety culture. Sure. I've been dealing with this for six years. Um, we have 300 workers and probably 150 to 200 wear turbans. Uh, and I visit three to four sites a day. Basically, we do, uh, we do our orientation, we talk about it. We do our training, we talk about it. We do toolboxes, we talk about it. We do, ref I go on the job site, I talk about it. If a worker fails to follow, they are immediately uh, taken into my uh, discipline structure because I'll give them a verbal, then I'll give them a written. And if they fail to uh, follow, then um, they come into my office. And now they got to tell the owner why they refuse to follow the law. Because I've tried the suspension. I've tried, you know, I won't terminate somebody because of a, a, a turban, but I will suspend them because I'm not going to talk and talk and talk till I'm blue in the face and they do nothing about it. So Is that getting buy-in though? Like... The buy-in is when you make them sit in front of the owner and tell them why you refuse to, to wear your PPE properly. I, I, as a white woman, I don't have any more voice with them. They just go, yeah, whatever. They'll go, yes, yes. They sit there in the group. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. And the minute I leave, it's back to the way it was. I've seen this for six years and I'm done fighting that fight. So now I give them three warnings and after that, they're coming in and they're going to tell my owner, who is Punjab, why they refuse to follow that. And but uh, let's look at driving. other it, let's look at other let's broad, broaden this up and kind of look at safety as okay. a value in mm -hmm. a whole, though, sure. right? Not just one narrow slice. So how can we if, if we're walking into a culture where there is a a poor value, like safety is not valued in general, how how have you, Janice, helped get the those people to buy into the value of safety? In your real life stories. That's you awesome. For sure. Sure. Just to go back on uh, just a second though. So when you take them in, I understand like from a cultural perspective, you're holding them accountable and they need to be responsible for their actions. Uh, with the, the culture aspect and safety, I think it's not so much the value as it is the education because we do learn from our experiences and unfortunately, like maybe they just never had those experiences because when they come over from like South Asia or uh, India specifically, and then they come out here, it's a whole different world out here. And by you sharing your experiences and, and share story sharing is so powerful. It is so powerful. And by you actually investing and telling them, hey, you know what, this happened to somebody else or this happened to me. It is huge. It Absolutely. is huge. I agree yeah. with you. Yeah.
Definitely. That's when I got the buy into marrows because they couldn't relate to it. They, I had to, you know, like my, my owner gave me the hint. He said, show them pictures, tell them yeah. stories. You yeah. know, and that was what made a huge, not, a, not only our supervisors, the main thing, when I made them realize that under the WCB law, under the act, how responsible they had to be. And so, nobody had ever told them that before. Yeah. Right. So one of your tactics was to let them know educate. what their accountability was under the law. Yeah, I, I use that in retail. It's very powerful. They don't understand that it's actually a legislation. It's not your personal opinion. And, and when you level that up, it totally changes the playing field for sure. What other tactics can you share with our audience that you might have used? The most powerful one was the stories. Mm -hmm. The other one is taking them along on my journey. For example, I'll, I'll take, if I've done an orientation for a new young worker, um, I'll take, you know, three or four of them that I know just started and I'll walk them through a job site. And I'll say, while we're walking, I want you to observe as many hazards as possible and, and, um, count them and then we'll 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 have a quick little meeting at the end and then we're going to walk back and I'm going to point them out because that's a part of buying in too is showing them right it's not about talking stories you got to show them why this is unsafe because like Amandeep said education is key training is key if we don't educate and train these little kids from these villages you're right they're going to make a ton of mistakes and get hurt but yeah you've got I love taking these young kids and I'll find one that has English uh, understanding and I'll say, you can explain in Punjabi while I explain this. And we have such a great time together. Mm -hmm. And what that's doing is it's we're partnering. They're seeing I'm not such a bad guy. They actually see that a white woman's not a bad person. I'm not their boss. I'm there. I'm working with them, not against them. That yeah. was their biggest fear is I was working against them. And yeah. so they weren't buying in. Mm -hmm. And when I showed them that I was here for them to support them, that I was here to keep them safe and make sure they go home to their family. And, and what can I do to help you understand? Then all of a sudden it changed. And did you find that when you, you know, started that process of walking with them to talk about what kind of identifiable risks were in the, the site, did that start to change where they would bring you and say, hey, Janice, I'm seeing these sites. So so the value was that you respected them. And so right. they came back to you and then trusted you to help them. What about yeah. that play? Taking it so now they call me and they when they see near misses, they don't they 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 would never call me. They would never. But I've given every worker my card. And I'll say, if you want me to keep you safe and you aren't getting support from your coworkers or your supervisor, I'm your next phone call. I want them to know they can trust me. I want them to know that I'm there for them. You have to. They don't know. Honestly, they come from a village. They don't know. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting because like I've worked with. So in uh, British Columbia, Canada. I believe um, specifically in the lower mainland, 70 to 80% of residential construction is predominantly Punjabi speaking. And so because I come from that background, I have an in. And so uh, dealing with like a lot of contractors, a lot of developers, a lot of times they want to do the right thing. They want to make sure that their workers are safe. They're following the law. Uh, you know, the, the rule of the land, but they just simply do not know what it is. They don't have that education. They're not sure what to say when they call the regulator. They're, if anything, they're afraid of WCB because they, they're just not sure and they just simply do not understand and they don't know. And so what Janice has done at, at her organization, it is so monumental, it's so pivotal and for you to break through that culture and especially being a woman, because I can tell you growing up, it's, you know, inside my house, it was great. And sometimes, yeah, there were biases where my brothers were allowed to go out and I wasn't. And it is what it is. It's a part of the culture. It's a part of those upbringings as well. But now when you take those values, beliefs, opinions, those, those core fundamentals, those building blocks, and now you apply them and shift them over to work. And it, it is very different. 
it is. It's a whole different situation. It's a whole different scenario. Um, a lot of the owners, they they want to do the right thing. They just don't know how to guide and direct their, their workers. And Janice, what you do, you're so brilliant at this, is exactly that. You take these new and young workers and then you educate them. And education is key. It's simple. It, um, it comes with the experience and it's coupled and it definitely, but how are we going to progress, right? We need to educate, educate through story sharing and through different materials and train them and make sure that they're, they're armed with all the knowledge that we possibly can so that when they're in the work site, they're making sure we're making sure that they're safe. They're making sure that they're safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think also when, oh, Malcolm has a question. Malcolm, unmic and come on in. It's really a, a, a great dialogue going here. Um, Janice, I really enjoy what you're saying because, you know, early, you know, early in my, my early exposures was a tough grandma running a ranch and uh, the, uh, and then another tough lady with the four sixes ranch, you know, uh, being the only lady with all them cowboys and then uh, working feed and grain, you know, we had one woman and 70 men. And I saw the things that went, she went to, but uh, what you described is, hold, you know, hold to your standard, set the rules, hold people accountable and build trust is the key thing for uh, male and female. And I think I took some of that to me when I first entered the Navy because I was in the hospital corps. And so I had to work on a medical ward with all female wow. nurses. And I was the only dude. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a reverse. <laughs> <laughs> reverse. And, um, and so uh, what I had to do was understand the, the culture, the organization, and the rules and apply myself to that. And if I had a question or concerns, you know, I had to find a trusted nurse I could go to and get that information. And it wasn't, it wasn't easy, you know, because uh, uh, you have the male ego and you have female ego and you have to work through that yourself. Yeah. You know? And uh, I, you know, it's a good perspective because I'm an employer, you know, I employ men and women. And, um, you know, what we do is, you know, the rule of reciprocity, you know, you get what you give back. And uh, growing up in the Navy, you know, uh, women used to have administrative roles and they took on more active roles, you know, in combatant uh, positions, nuclear uh, engineering and stuff like that. So I've seen women in the last 30 years, you know, come to the forefront of the industry and really do an exceptional job. And I think as a, an employer, it's good for me to hear uh, the perspective outside of my organization. You know, so I can have the my the right mindset when I speak to my staff. So thank you. You're very welcome. That is so awesome, Malcolm. I have a question for you. So when you were in that role where you're you were surrounded by females, uh, were you elevated? Were you empowered? Were there any negative experiences, uh, whether it be with your <laughs> peer group, your coworkers, or upper management, where you felt discriminated as being the only male? Working in nursing, you know, earlier, you know, when you're a male, uh, you're automatically uh, tasked with all the lifting and grunt oh, work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, picking up patients, lifting, turning and stuff like that. Uh, and so, yeah, there was some of that. But for the most part, uh, everybody was respectful of each other, you know. And, um, you know, you had some that, you know, um, through education bias and stuff, you know, you know, where they were, you know, at this level, you'd get some of that, but as long as you did your job and you continue to uh, try to learn and apply those principles, you normally got their respect. Yeah. You know? yeah. And then, you know, as, as I moved up, you know, where women came into engineering and stuff like that, you know, they would come in with a, a barrier, you know, uh, you know a, a wall, that you know we had to overcome, you know, because automatically everybody had these ideals, you know, that 
yeah, uh, she can't do this because she's petite or, you know, she's never done it before, but they always turn it around, you know, especially like uh, in our firefighting, you know, shipboard firefighting, you know, uh, the girls really did an exceptional job and proved themselves wow. in the community. Yeah. And now um, I don't see that it ever gets questioned, you know, what their capabilities are, especially in our, uh, especially in law enforcement, firefighting, and equipment operators. Yeah. And then when I was uh, in oil in Russia, oil and gas with Exxon, um, we'd have women at the camp, you know, in administrative or safety roles, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, a thousand knuckleheads, you know, a thousand to two of them, you know. So, so I understand, you know, uh, yeah, uh, the em employees hitting on each other and stuff like that. And, you know, us as managers have to set a standard too, you know. We don't use off-color jokes. Uh, we don't put up posters. You know, when we do PowerPoints, they're all professional, and we don't separate anybody. We talk to the job and the standard, and that helps uh, both parties. Yes. Hope I asked your question. <laughs> yeah. 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 Absolutely. I love that because I've never really gotten the perspective of a male being in a female-dominated. Uh, workforce or organization. Um, one other question, when you were getting promoted up the ranks, did your gender play a role in that or did it have anything to do with you being promoted? Well, our promotion system, you know, is based on evaluation. You know, you get an evaluation uh, from your uh, superiors, plus you have to uh, get signed off on certain criteria and then you go in front of a, uh, a board. So there are different points. There may be some, uh, uh, if there was a bias towards male, uh, uh, it wasn't it wasn't enough to be fine at, you know, for advancement, you know. And uh, if if there was an offset in the balance, uh, the uh, Bureau of Na Bureau of Navy would uh, give a credit towards. Uh, the females, you know, so they get a one, one point to balance that uh, diversity. Yeah. And uh, I don't really see that too much in the, the commercial area. The, the gals really have to press hard, you know, to get up there. And, uh, but, you know, I know quite a few women that own construction companies and they run proposals, they run a lot of jobs and they hold a lot of respect you know, in the community and with their workers. I think, as uh, Janice said, you know, men and women are needed in an industry to balance it and bring different perspective. And it helps uh, helps the company a lot. Um, mm -hmm. But I had kind of a disadvantage before I went into nursing. You know, like I said, I had grandma who was a strong rancher running things. I had a mother and three sisters too, you know, so. Wow. Yeah. So I've always been surrounded uh, uh, by women, uh, some pretty strong ones at, at that. That's but. awesome. Yeah. yeah, that is so great. Thank you so much for sharing. I, I totally, I really appreciate that. All right. really appreciate well, I appreciate y'all for inviting me. This is a good perspective. Like I said, on my side, it's nice to hear the thoughts and what's going on. So when I approach my employees, you know, I can go in there with the right mindset. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Um, Janice, coming back to you, the, um, the future of women in safety and women in construction, where do you see, where do you see it going? Where do you see us? And what, I came, what, I saw, I conquered. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, that. I love that. You know, great risks are worth, um, you know, worthwhile, uh, you got to look at the old issues and then you got to find a new way. Um, we, we cannot keep repeating the past, right? No, absolutely not. So, um, and that you can say that all day long, I came, I saw I conquered because as we change, we conquered that now next, you know, I think we just have to keep moving forward. Like everything is moving forward at such a fast pace in technology. I don't think safety is going to move that fast, but what okay. I would like to see is that, um, Malcolm appreciates it that we all find a balance in this in this uh, industry, right? 
um, that men don't feel like they need to have big booming voices over us and, and put us down. I just feel like we need to just all be respected. Um, I can't say even by degree, because there can be a lot of us who are a lot smarter just by being in the field. So I yeah. think just keep Absolutely. going. Um, Women coming into health and safety or into construction, like what words of advice do you have for them? Um, make your tomorrows rewarding. You cannot live in the past and dwell in the past, yeah. right? One of the things maybe Malcolm can relate to with me, we're of that age where you've learned through your life at, you know, 30s, 40s, you know, tomorrow's in her, you, know, blah, blah, blah. you learn, right? So you learn from your past and you have to stop making those mistakes. You have to reinvent. You got to find new ways. You're always proactive. You cannot be reactive, right? Because I'm proactive and because I'm looking for the next new way, I think we're going to keep moving forward. Everything has to continue to move forward. We're going to become more digital. Um, I just don't see falling back to our old ways. We can't. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If, we, if the changes are compelling and we can train, we can teach, education is so key in the field, not in school. I've got girls who've never stepped onto a job site, haven't got a clue what to do, and they're safety coordinators. Wow. No training. And education goes both ways. I think that's yeah. one thing, you know, after my 45 and, and getting into my 50s, I realized that, you know, so little and yeah. by taking on and listening other people's experiences, you gain so much that you can leverage their experience and not even have to suffer the consequences that they already suffered, mm -hmm. you know? So, so that's like priceless. It's like, yes, let me know what to look at for. What are those red flags? You know, and I'm scribbling in my book when people are talking. So I, I have it up here so I can forecast. Now, I know that we're getting to the end of our session. We could just keep on going here, but, you know, I wanted to give you the chance, Janice, to leave our audience with some closing thoughts. What would you like to say? We have to look at the, everything is constant. Everything is moving, right? And we all tend to not want to get out of our comfort zone. But it's when you break your comfort zone is when you break barriers. And you might be sweating and your palms are, aren't able to grip anything and, and you're stuttering, but you gotta find your voice and just keep moving forward. Forget the past, the past does not serve you. When you waste so much time gossiping about the past or focusing on the past, you're wasting so much time of what could be in your future, right? It's kind of like when you go on a blind date with a guy. He wants to talk about your past. I don't, because that was my past. Let's talk about our future and what we are gonna do in our future. So think about your future, move forward step by step. It doesn't have to be big moves. You just have to be quit living in the past, move forward. I like that. I like that. Definitely. Love that. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank and you I very really much. Love that too. Yeah. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Awesome. Does the audience have any other closing or any you know, final thoughts, comments, questions, anything? You know, Amandeep, a lot of people tend to uh, fall under peer pressure. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that peer pressure can almost be a killer of, um, of joy or killer of, of uh, you know, if you want to move forward, but you, you go to your peers, oh, is this the right move? Is this the wrong move? I know our peers can be helpful, but peer pressure can also be destroying. And I want, uh, I don't want to be measured by any one thing, I want to be recognized. So the only way you're going to get recognized is to be different. If you act the same way and you follow the same, like, you know, I can look at California girls and they all look the same, right? But I'm yeah. going to go down there and be the redhead with the big eyes, you know, or something. I'm going to be different. I want to stand out. I want you to remember me. So it's not about the peer pressure. It's not about uh, falling back and, and holding on to old habits. Tony Robbins was a, a great mentor. Uh, he did a, a two-day conference in Calgary, Unleash the Power Within. 
And on your third day, you walked on 50 feet of fire, burning hot coals. It was terrifying. I didn't feel one thing because your mind is so powerful. Don't fall to the peer pressure. Don't fall to the habits. Don't fall to the past. Use your mind. I can tell you stories about people. I've been in that business where people can bend spoons with their mind. Your mind is so powerful. We can destroy ourselves or we can make ourselves the best version of who we are. It's our choice. No one gives us our happiness. No one, we might have people to help us in our decisions, but your choices have to be who you are. You have to stand strong for who you are. Forget the peer pressure. Absolutely. It doesn't serve you. Yeah. Agree. Agree. Yeah. I, I, I know that, um, you know, living by your, your values and your principles and having those, as my friend Kathy likes to say, you know, what is your North Star? can be very empowering to getting you to your next level. Yeah, for sure, definitely. That's oh. awesome, that is so powerful. Um, thank you so much, Janice. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much for coming on. I totally appreciate you being so vulnerable and opening up and just sharing your experiences with all of us here today, the audience with Ta Tamara and myself as well. Yeah. No, this yeah. has been great. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Amandeep, uh, for being with us doing this co-hosting from Salas. So we appreciate that you're joining to do this. So thank you, everybody, for joining us and uh, being here to listen. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And we're Thanks, looking, forward, looking forward to next week, guys. Make sure everyone's coming out. The panel, we're going to bring back Janice, Can uh, Candace, as well as Stacy, and it's going to be awesome. It's going to be really good. I think so. I think so. Yes. And yeah. put in your email in the chat if you want me to add you to the um, calendar invite to come for that session. And then I'll know to uh, put people in for that session. Awesome. Great. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. Have Bye. a good day, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. You too. Bye. Bye.